Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gen Ed. We're really excited today to, to have a series first. We have two guests on this week. We're getting pretty crazy. Production buzz- budget is clearly going up. Um, today, we're joined by Samarth Desai and Nick Danby um, to, to, talk some, to talk about some speeches and some great speeches throughout history. So maybe starting with Samarth, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Samarth Desai. Uh, I was a WAVE teacher in the summer of 2020. I co-taught with my friend here, Nick Danby, uh, Great Speeches of History. We taught that two times, first time with 40 students, the second time with 90 students. And then we taught a class on foreign policy called Making History. Um, but uh, I'm originally from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. I went to Harvard College uh, for four years. I studied social studies spent most of my time on kind of political philosophy, foreign policy, constitutional law. And I was also heavily involved with the Harvard Mock Trial Association. So a lot of public speaking there, um, as well as uh, a foreign policy club. I also co-founded with Nick called uh, the Alexander Hamilton Society. And then I also worked as a research assistant to a professor at the Harvard Law School named Noah Feldman. Uh, thank you, Martha. And uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nick Danby, a co-taught uh, those three classes with the Smarth on the Wave Learning Festival. Uh, Smarth did mention, perhaps because he's embarrassed, that uh, we were roommates uh, throughout college. Uh, so we, we were roommates in, in sophomore, junior, and senior year. And so we spent most of our time. Fortunately for Nick and unfortunately uh, for me. <laughs> it's a, it's I tried my hardest. I tried my hardest lot. to find someone else who would live with me, but no one else was willing. And so yeah, I was stuck a with a bad Nick. reflection on you, Smarth. Um, and so we had, we had a good time. And we, uh, I studied uh, history. At Harvard, uh, with Smarth, uh, him studying more political theory, me studying more, you know, the, the roots of the past, and uh, very much like him, I did mock trial uh, for two years, and then we co-founded the Alton Hamilton Society, which is about getting young people involved in foreign policy and national security uh, throughout the country, and specifically for our own domain at Harvard. Uh, served as a research assistant as well uh, on, a, on a few projects, one particularly uh, Professor Logabald's uh, two-volume series on Kennedy, uh, the first book which just came out uh, this past fall. And then I uh, did a lot of debate in high school, a lot of public speaking, uh, would introduce candidates for political campaigns, which is where my love of oratory uh, came into fruition. Uh, graduated uh, Harvard with Smarth in May and then uh, entered into becoming a naval officer, now a naval intelligence officer based in uh, Virginia Beach and, and will be um, deploying uh, elsewhere to actually carry out my intel officer duties uh, next February. Nice. So, Nick, you touched on um, what you want to do in the future, where you're heading. Um, so, Marth, uh, you were studying social studies. So what do you plan to continue after school? Well, I'm currently working as an associate consultant at uh, Bain & Company based out of their D.C. office. Uh, kind of more medium term, I'm planning to go to law school. Uh, I really like constitutional law. I really like uh, antitrust law. And so I'm hoping to study more of that in a couple of years. And then longer term, uh, I, I really don't know. It's, it's, uh, it, it's definitely wide open for me. I think a career in appellate advocacy would be very cool. Um, I think just more broadly speaking, a career in government and public service uh, is, is something I'm interested in. Awesome. Samarth, I'm, I'm actually considering doing some consulting right after college myself. There you go. So. Maybe maybe we should chat sometime about uh, oh, your oh experience. Oh no! Oh that. no! It's happening already. It's, he's already too young. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's already corrupted me. It's too late. Yeah, it's too late. <laughs> well, I'm I'm wondering. You guys both have quite the history with with oratory and and public speaking, and I'm just wondering what drew you guys to to speech. What what got you guys so interested in it, and why is it important and and really interesting to study and i'll throw it to nick first yeah thank you daniel i think for me from a very young age i was uh, my dad's a political cartoonist for a newspaper so from a very young age i was exposed to politics and presidency and you know if you're exposed to those things early on one of the key elements uh, a president is is not only commander-in-chief and you know the persuader and debater-in-chief but he's he's the communicator-in-chief and so he sets the, the tone, the standard for the country. And so I became very fascinated with public speaking. Uh, from a young age, sometimes you know, people say, how do you become a public speaker? How do you overcome anxiety? 
people ask me that question a lot. And for me, it's kind of a, it's a cop-out answer, but I never really felt that anxious about it. I love speaking. I love theater. I did it for, for many years. And so just speaking to people and giving a, giving a speech was kind of my, my bread and butter. Uh, and so it was a perfect match. You know, my, I had my father as an influence and then I liked it myself. And so from uh, a very early age around, I'd say eight or nine, I started working in presidential campaigns and political campaigns in the state of Maine, where I'm from, Bangor, Maine. And uh, when I was 12, I had the opportunity to introduce one of the candidates I worked for at the, at the Maine uh, Democratic Convention uh, in the state. And so that was my first kind of big foray. I had done smaller things, but it was a, about 2,000, 3,000 people in the audience, um, you know, quivering, you know, 12-year-old. Um, you know, maybe much, much smaller in size and much higher in voice. It was pre-puberty. So it was, it was, it's a frightening, you can watch a speech online, it's frightening. But uh, at the same time, it kind of set my love for, I love speaking to people. I loved, you know, painting a story, telling, uh, telling a story. And of course, maybe I also like the applause as a 12 year old, but I really like communicating with people in kind of that math level. And so from there on, it just skyrocketed. I did debate in high school uh, for all four years. I was very fortunate to do well on the national circuit. And that kind of led me to uh, my spot at Harvard. And, and, and even then with Smart, I did mock trial. And and so it was always a, a feeling, I guess, and I think Smart feels the same way, that whenever we had to present in class or whenever we had to speak about it, it's just there's a lot of joy for me. It's, I think, you know, kind of my, my serenity uh, spot, my zen, if you will. I think for people, it's most people, it's the exact opposite, right? You have to give a speech and you're terrified of it. But for me, I, I've, I've found no better peace, no better place to kind of be in the zone than when talking to people in a broad audience. And that's just for me. And it's just, I feel at home and maybe because I've done it for so long. Uh, but I think the most important part for people that's applicable uh, that are listening in the, with people that Smart and I taught is that everything in life when you become an adult is really all about writing and speaking. And, and so I think even in my sense in the career, career in the military, I'm probably not going to stay for 30 years. I'm definitely going to you know, join Smart from law school uh, later on. But even here, everything is about writing and speaking. And if you study great oratory and you become a good public speaker, it'll make your college presentations, your work presentations substantially easier. So I think it's a crux uh, in life that you should really develop, but also a a fun thing to do on the side as well to to hone your own abilities to engage and communicate and interact. For me, it really started with stories about my grandfather that my dad would tell me. He was a lawyer back in India. And when I was a kid, my dad would always tell me these stories about how uh, my grandfather would argue on one side of the case, and then all of a sudden he would switch to the other side of the case. And the judges would be amazed, the people in the audience would be amazed at not only the argument itself that he was making, but also the the eloquence and the skill with which he made the argument. Uh, And and in, in addition to that, I think like Nick, I read a lot of history, a lot of political history growing up, uh, all about the presidents and and politicians from American history. Um, And whenever you read about them, speeches, it's part of what they do. Every day they're making speeches. Uh, And and the the biggest historical events in American history are always accompanied by great speeches. Uh, And so I began to kind of search for opportunities to develop that skill. And I also knew, like like Nick said, that that being able to give speeches, being able to convince other people of my point of view was going to be an important skill no matter what I ended up pursuing. And so I pursued these opportunities. Uh, and I, I remember very early on when I was in middle school and I was giving my first speeches. I remember, like Nick said, he was quivering. I remember my whole body was shaking. My hands were shaking. My legs were shaking. I was kind of hiding behind the podium. Uh, my voice was very low. Um, and it, I was very nervous. It was a very frightening experience. But at the same time, it was very exciting for me to be able to, to speak in front of people like that. And so I wanted to get better and get better. When I, when, uh, when I went to high school, Uh, I ended up joining the mock trial team there, um, which was led at the time by a really fantastic teacher named Mr. Adam Carlisle at Wyoming Seminary. And he helped me really develop my public my public speaking skills. He really helped me to slow down, but also to, you know, be able to to shift my voice and use hand gestures and and all all the different things that we cover in our class, great speeches of history. Uh, and I just practiced a lot because of mock trial, you know, hours, hundreds of hours per year, if, if you add it up. Um, and then when I went to college, I also did mock trial there. And so, you know, in, in total, I think Nick and I have probably spent, I, I think this is no exaggeration, thousands of hours honing our public speaking abilities. But each time we do it, we get a little better. And for me, just like Nick said, it's, I, I don't know, there's a certain feeling that you get when you're in front of an audience no matter whether that audience is just six people at dinner or whether it's an audience of hundreds of people, but you being the only one, everyone's listening to you and you have a certain period of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 
where everyone's attention is focused on you and you have that opportunity to convince people of something or to, to affect their emotions in some way, make them happy, make them laugh, make them sad, make them cry. Uh, it's a really fantastic feeling. And it combines so many different disciplines. You know, you have to have strong logic. You have to be a strong writer. You have to understand human psychology. Um, you, you know, you have to have a, an aesthetic sense, kind of a, a poetic sense for the way that words work and, and what words sound good. Um, and so it, it's, it's very exciting for me. Um, and as to, as to why you should study public speaking or rhetoric, um, it, it really goes back to no matter what you do in today's modern world, you have to be able to convince people of your point of view. You're, you're always going to have to be able to convince a group of people. If, you're, if you go into politics or law, that group of people might be very large. But even if you go to other fields, you know, that group of people might be five or six. But it's, it's a very important skill to have and to develop. Yeah, just going off of um, what Samarth um, just touched base on, Nick, do you have anything to add? Or like, what's your perspective on why speeches and rhetoric and public speaking are all worth studying? Like, um, how can it be beneficial for someone today to go back in time and read a speech from a hundred or so years ago? Absolutely. And I think as I, I perhaps mentioned a little earlier and, and to put a final point on it is everything you do in the modern world, no matter your job will involve writing and speaking. And I know the, the market of co of, uh, you know, coding and technology is, is just trying to take over and people don't think soft skills like writing and speaking are going to matter as much anymore, but they will. And they, they have for me in any position I've been in. And so by studying speeches, you can improve your skills uh, in that sense because you're, you're copying, you can imitate them. Uh, you know, how did I begin to become a good speaker? I watched all the great speeches of history. I listened to Churchill's We Shall Fight in the Beaches. I watched Mario Cuomo's 1984 Democratic Convention address. And then I would look at their speech transcripts and I would give the speech myself. And I'd see what I would do differently, what I did perhaps better or what I did perhaps worse. And I studied their argument, their flow, right? Speeches, as, as Mark was alluding to, are, are a major combination of argument, of rhetoric, of passion, um, of logic. And so you can hone all these skills by seeing how the masters did it. Right. You can't just jump cold turkey into becoming an order uh, with having no idea what to do. Right. Great musicians study and copy great musicians. They do covers of certain albums or songs and great writers imitate the styles of, of other writers. And then the same thing goes for oratory, both in how you deliver speech and how you write that speech. And so they're worth studying for those reasons. Um, it'll prove your, your abilities, but it's also history, right? You can see what men or women do, how they can persuade somebody. So the next time you need to walk into a meeting with, let's say, a group of people that are your bosses and persuade them to give you a raise, per se, you can see how other great men and women of history use their persuasive ability to get what they wanted or how they mourn somebody in a, in a eulogy or how they congratulate somebody in a wedding. We'll all have to give perhaps a eulogy someday, a toast at a wedding. And so if you look back and see how certain men and women brought people to tears or to jubilation, you can also mirror that in your own life. Uh, and I think lastly, perhaps it also offers us a greater perspective on the human condition. Smarth and I based our class not on uh, chronology or specific people, but on human themes, right? One class was about pain and suffering. One was about inspiration, and action. One was about hope and death. And so there were all ways of teaching how humans dealt uh, with these emotions and with the human condition through the power of oratory. And I think lastly, maybe the, the final point of why it's important studying is because of, of free speech, right? These are people who were able to deliver these speeches to were able to motivate people. And it's important to remember the power that one person has uh, to motivate and change an entire world through the power of a few words and a few sentences. Obviously, those, those various speeches that you just mentioned were, you know, very different in their purpose, very different in their historical context. And, and very different from, from the point of view and the perspective of, of the person who gave the speech. But what is it that makes a good speech and some of these great speeches of history, what makes them so impactful? What makes them so significant in kind of the, the global, in the global perspective? Well, one of the things that makes them impactful is that they, that, I mean, and it, it alludes to what Nick was saying a moment ago when he was talking about how we centered our class on the human, on, on themes regarding the human condition. Each of the speeches that we chose and, and that are, you know, that stand out from world history, 
they all speak to something broader about just uh, they all speak to something broader than just the historical event in question right so we go back to and, and I, I know alana said you know speeches from 100 years ago our class was covering speeches from 2000 years ago because we really believe that the elements of the human condition they stay the same throughout time so the first speech that we covered in our class was the funeral oration by pericles this is uh i think this is like around 400 bc if i'm not mistaken probably a, a little earlier than that and uh and the setting for the speech the context is that there's a war going on called the peloponnesian war between athens and sparta and it's the end of the first year of the war and uh and pericles's job is to mourn the dead the, the dead soldiers who passed away after the first year of fighting. And so Pericles, what he could have done is just said, here's the list of the, of the people who died. And they were very brave soldiers. Uh, and it's very sad that they died. But Pericles goes beyond that. And that's what makes it a truly great speech. Instead of just providing a list and instead of just talking about the past year, he places the war and, and the fallen in the context of Athens itself as a city. And even broader, even broader than that, in the context of democracy, which is the form of government that Athens had and, and basically invented. And so he talks about these themes of why Athens is a great city, because we have democracy, because we have freedom of speech, because we let everybody participate in government. And for that reason, we're better than our opponent, Sparta. And the, these themes, I mean, they travel through time. They're almost timeless. Even today, if you read the, the speech of Pericles, the funeral oration, you'll be in, in, in some ways inspired by you know, the form of government that Athens created, how revolutionary they were in political terms. And for that reason, if you compare Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to Pericles' funeral oration, you'll realize that Lincoln himself was inspired by Pericles, that he actually stole some of the ideas and some of the language that Pericles used uh, in, um, in 1863 when he was writing the Gettysburg Address. And so in the same way that we can be inspired by these past figures, Lincoln himself, uh, Lincoln himself was inspired. Um, and and I, I think that's the mark of a truly great speech is that it's talking about themes and, and conditions that are really timeless, that 2,000 years later, we can still tap into and understand and appreciate. And I would just add on smart, to the good point, which is that not only is it, is it human condition themes, but it's also perhaps the historical impact or influence on a society. And so it's it's an important question to, to parse out and discern, which is that our, our class was entitled The Great Speeches of History, not the most impactful, the most important speeches of history, for actually a deliberate reason, which is that sometimes the greatest speeches, the, the best written speeches in the world are not the most important speeches. Uh, and I think for, for us, I would say maybe someone would disagree with me that some of the great speeches that we had in our class, for example, uh, Reagan's Challenger Address, or even maybe the Gettysburg Address, FDR's Pearl Harbor, uh, Lou Gehrig's throw on the baseball, were not the most important speeches in history. The Gettysburg Address wasn't the most, it didn't change history, uh, but it was a great speech, and that's how I remember it. And then at the same time, some of the great, most impactful speeches of history are not necessarily the best, right? Like William Wilberforce's speech calling for the abolition of slavery uh, in the early 19th century isn't a, a well-written speech in my, in my case, but it was important in putting Britain on the road to abolition and then to, you know, America following suit. Uh, and I think the same thing for maybe even Gandhi's Quit India speech. It's not the greatest act of rhetoric, but it is an important milestone in, in Indian history and also in British history. So there's kind of like a fine line. And so I think Samar's entirely right. The human condition plays a role, but also the delivery of this speech, what did it do to spur further historical events? And I think one of the, the best speech that perhaps does both of those is Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death, which Samar and I taught in our class, which is not only is it perhaps a master class in rhetoric and, and great technique, but it is also perhaps one of the most impactful speeches of the American Revolution in setting the firestorm that led uh, to the Declaration of Independence and our ineffable independence. You guys are really making speeches sound interesting to me. I haven't had the best experience with speeches. Like um, eighth grade, everyone had to memorize the Gettysburg Address. And for me, it was more like a checkbox, just me memorizing it. But I really enjoyed speeches during my English class, actually. I'm like major like anti-history. I don't really enjoy it. I enjoy science a lot more. Um, 
but Dickens like the total opposite. He loves history. So um, in my English classes, like um, we read, uh, you know, the typical, like I have a dream, Martin Luther King, but also um, what stands out to me is like just um, how Samarth was talking about um, Athens, Greece. It reminds me of like Julius Caesar and Brutus's speech. And I love just analyzing and figuring out like why they included um, certain words or tone and, I can definitely see how themes come across in a whole more than a lifetime, but like world time, if that's even a a saying. Um, But uh, so what can we, so I, I know we touched over it. What can we learn from like analyzing and going over past speeches? I really find it fascinating how you guys talked about, um, what's going on in the world in that time and what's happening if we look back um into history like how that impacted it um are there any ways like we can kind of decode or decipher these speeches and how can we apply it to creating our own speeches or um looking at some like a different presidential speech in today's world uh yeah absolutely i mean it it, 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 it's it's interesting that you mentioned the example uh, from Julius Caesar of Brutus's speech, because we know that Brutus did deliver a speech historically, but the speech in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar is obviously a fictionalized version. You know, clearly Brutus probably did not uh, speak those exact words. Um, Sam, are, but, are we talking about Brutus or Mark Anthony? Well, both of them, de- both of them delivered speeches, right? In, no, in no, are, are, yeah. are we talking about the, uh, the Friends, Romans, Countrymen speech? Uh, well, that yeah, that's that's yeah. Mark Anthony's, but yeah, yeah. So both both in, in Julius Caesar, both both uh, Brutus's speech and Mark Anthony's speech, Shakespeare kind of fictionalized and and took some some liberties. But in in terms of the way Shakespeare wrote, every single word mattered, right? Every single word, every single comma. Uh, when actors deliver it, as as Nick played Mark Anthony in a wonderful production of Julius Caesar that I that I uh, was was fortunate enough to witness, uh, every pause that that Nick took when delivering that speech mattered. And when, so that those were fake speeches, but when in real life, historical figures delivered real speeches, they did the exact same thing, right? There is such a literary element to it where every single word, and we actually have uh, documents. I, I, I always use Lincoln as an example because I've just read so much about Lincoln. We have, we have his first draft and then we have his second draft and his final drafts. And we can see the changes that he that he made, and every single word he chose very carefully. He would he would replace commas. He would replace dashes. He uh, and, and, and Churchill did the same thing. So in terms of what we can learn from them, I think it gives you a, a first of all better appreciation for history, as Nick has been saying. But it also allows you to learn from the masters themselves as to how to write well, uh, which is such an important skill today. And so you can you can take some of what they do and you can apply it to your own writing, whether you're writing essays, whether you're writing you know, book reviews or book summaries, whether you're delivering speeches yourself of which words are the best to use. How, you know, c- can I say this exact same thing, but can I say it in a more concise way? Or can I say it in a more powerful way? Can I say it in a more emotional way? Um, how can I better structure my argument? If you look at the great speeches that, that we study, they're all so tightly structured. You know, Every single point lines up with the next point, and all of them tie together to make one big point. And so when we write essays or book reviews or speeches, we also want to follow that, that same structure uh, that, that people from the past have used. Yeah, and I would add on to that, Samarth, and to your point, Alana, I think there's two points. One is these, these speeches and analyzing and going over them teach you first how to write, as Samarth is talking about, and also to how to connect with people. And I think, you know, in, in this, as Mark said, in terms of connecting with people, when I played Mark Anthony, you know, obviously the Friends, Romans, Countrymen speech has been done so often in the history of the world that uh, I had to kind of make it my own. And so every, I, I analyzed that speech to probably, it was marked up every word, right? How do you pronounce a certain word? You know, he says, you know, for, you know, Brutus is a good man or, uh, you know, there's a, there's a repetition in that speech. It's heavy on an aphor. And so you have to say each repetitive phrase differently, right? Each one has a different meaning to it. Uh, for Brutus is an honorable man, right? It starts off that he wants the crowd to believe that he believes Brutus is an honorable man. But by the end, obviously, the point of the speech is that Brutus is far from honorable. 
And so how do you convey that, that change over from trying to persuade the crowd that you are speaking good to speaking ill? Of Marcus Brutus, and so for me, you know, those specific words, the phrases, the intonation was it was a kind of a, a great opportunity for me to show how I really thought good oratory should be conducted. Because you had a great vehicle, right? Oratory is great not just because of how you say it, but it's also great because of the speech vehicle, right? If you're a race car driver and you're driving a moped versus a, a Maybach, you're going to do a lot better in the Maybach. So you have to have a good vehicle to, to, to deliver on. But of course, in the end, to knock out of the park, you have to have great delivery. And so, you know, in terms of that connecting, that was an op- a great opportunity. Churchill, who I think is perhaps one of the greatest orders in, in world history, uh, would look at historical events of the past. For example, William Wilberforce's abolition speech or uh, this, you know, the independence of America in 1776. And he would pretend that he was in the British Parliament, the British House of Commons in those times. He would, he would write a speech that he believed he would deliver if he was alive in, say, 1775. What is the speech he would give at different times? How would he sympathize with the American cause? Or how would he show a variety of, of emotions or thoughts? And so I, I practice this from time to time as well. If I was, let's say, uh, President Lincoln, if I was the president at that time when Gettysburg happened, what would I have said, right? And so by studying these speeches, you can see how the great men and women of history, people who we should idolize and, and, and look at, uh, what they did, how did they connect with people? What made them so effective as you look to connect with people in your own life? whenever house big or small, whether it's giving an inauguration speech or maybe a commencement speech at your college. And then in terms of the writing, I think to put a fine point on it, which is, and, and you had mentioned this a lot of the revision process. It's important not just to study the final product, but also the, the, the stages of revision. And one of my favorite points is that FDR would, would labor over his speeches constantly. And when he was drafting the Pearl Harbor uh, speech in December 8, 1941 that he gave to the public, the original version of the opening line was a date which will live in world history, which doesn't pop as much as what we all know is the final phrase, which is a date which will live in infamy. And if you look back at his final copy of the address, you will see world history crossed out in infamy replaced. It was a last minute change. But as you can see, as you, you know, the minutes leading up to his major address in front of Congress, perhaps the biggest speech Roosevelt ever gave in his career as president, he's still changing it. At the last minute, he changed it to perhaps one of the most memorable phrases in American oratorical history. And then perhaps the last point is to see how people write and change over time. Uh, there was a great study about, I'd say, seven or eight years ago talking about political rhetoric and how the grade level of presidential speeches has plummeted in recent years. In the 1800s and 1850s, presidents were giving speeches at a college grade reading level. And now presidents are giving speeches that are at a fourth or sixth grade reading level. So you can you can track how you can read a Washington speech, which is really written by Hamilton. You can read a Lincoln speech and you can say, wow, that is some, some power. And then you can read perhaps the speech of any person in modern politics and say, well, there's those words are a lot shorter and the sentences are a lot simpler. Maybe that means you're connecting with the public more. But does it also mean that presidents think our public is dumber or are they trying to appeal to them more? So I think that's, that's an important part to track, you know, the grade level of, of what our presidents are speaking and, and how as a country and as a world, perhaps that our oratory and our, our way of communicating is perhaps less uh, great than it once was, or at least less sophisticated. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's really, it's really, really fascinating that you can take structures of words and pauses and switch them out and change them such that you can have an actual impact on someone. You know, you can read Pericles' speech two thousand over 2,000 years after he gave it, and I can't connect at all with the struggle of Athens against Sparta in the Peloponnesian War, war and I can't connect with the, the fear in those citizens um, of Athens, but I can connect to the language that he uses. And I can be impacted today by how eloquently he he words his speech. It's it's almost like beautiful music that when you have a really eloquently written speech, you can you can feel it. You can feel impacted by it, even if the contents of the speech don't you know have really no bearing on your life. You can feel the power in in the words and. I liked this point you guys brought up of kind of studying these speeches and studying the revisions and kind of getting in, in their heads, in their, in their thought process and just seeing how they, these masters of, of oratory would, you know, create these masterpieces and how they thought it was best to, 
connect to, you know, their audience. And, and Nick, to your point about presidential speeches dropping in, in kind of their sophistication, I, I think it does have a lot to do with the intended audience. You know, when, when politicians were giving speeches in the 1800s, they were speaking primarily to other politicians, to other lawyers. They were speaking to highly educated people because, you know, the internet didn't exist. Television didn't exist. They weren't addressing necessarily the entirety of the country. Whereas today presidents, um, you know, are, are still for the most part, very highly educated. I mean, you look at Barack Obama, who is a very highly educated lawyer and a very gifted orator, and he's just trying to connect to a different audience, I think. And I still think those speeches, even though they're less sophisticated, can have a lot of, of impact. And, and while they're not perhaps quite as sophisticated, they still do their job of connecting to the public and being impactful to, to their audience. And I Absolutely, think that, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that, um, I, I don't want to put words in your guys's mouths. <laughs> um, and I'm perhaps getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I think a really important part of whenever you're speaking to any group of people is to be able to connect with them specifically, um, is, is always the most important part, but that, that leads me to ask you guys, like, what are, you know, public speaking is something that a lot of people really struggle with and something that um, is very intimidating to a lot of people. And, and yet, as you guys have mentioned, it's still so important, you know, in nearly every career, you're working with a group of people and you need to communicate with them well. So I'm wondering what are, what's some advice? What what are some tips, some tricks to, um, to not make us master orators like yourselves or, or like our, um, or like the great orators of the past, but just to, um, just to improve our public speaking abilities such that we can be effective and that we can connect with our audience. I don't know, Smarth, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, the single best thing you can do, and this will make you a master orator is to take our great speeches of history class. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. It, <laughs> it, it, for, for a low, low price of $99. <laughs> it, it will make you a, a better public speaker, but, but there, there are other things you can do as well. Um, in addition to reading the great speeches of history, the, the, really the best thing that you could do is to practice. And it's just like anything in life, practice makes perfect, right? So, you know, the, if, if you want to start giving speeches, what you don't want to do is find yourself uh, before 50 people and you've never done a, a you know, you've never done any, any sort of speech before, right? You want to practice on your own first. And this can literally be in your room in front of a mirror and you are, you know, you find a speech from history that you like. Maybe you really like Lincoln's second inaugural address, or maybe you really like Churchill's We Shall Fight on the Beaches speech. And you just recite that speech. You know, you don't even have to write your own. You can just recite one that somebody else has already written and you practice just slowly delivering that speech to yourself in the mirror. It's the equivalent of, you know, doing layups in your driveway alone, right? Not playing against anybody else, but just just getting the feel for it, getting the intuition. And once you're kind of comfortable speaking to yourself, then you you broaden it out a little bit. Then you look for opportunities to speak in front of small groups of people, right? The, the thing that we would always tell our students in, in our great speeches of history class was try to tell stories as much as possible at the dinner table right? Just four people, just five people, just six people. But, uh, you know, a lot of people, they don't, they don't want to take up that time. They, they get a little uh, intimidated or they get scared to, you know, tell a two minute story in front of a group of friends or in front of their family. Don't be afraid, right? Even if you mess up, it's just your family. No one's going to make fun of you. There, there are no consequences, but you know, you, you develop the skill there. And then, and the more you tell stories in front of people, you know, the more kind of intuition you develop for, oh, these things make people laugh or oh, people don't really like it when I say it like this. Uh, so then you, you get a little better there. And then, then you look for even more opportunities. You look for opportunities to present uh, in front of your classmates. You run for student council. You look for opportunities to present things in front of uh, parents or in front of teachers. And maybe you join a, a public speaking activity if you're in high school, like mock trial or like debate. And again, the more reps you get in, the more practice you get in, the more comfortable it becomes. And eventually, I, I think Nick and I are at this stage 
where we could, you know, be presenting in front of dozens, hundreds of people. And we're not really that scared because we've done it so many times. It's just like second nature to us. Yeah, and I'd add in, I'm not going to talk about smart hit of exactly. You practice makes perfect, right? I mean, if you, that's just the way it goes. Um, but I will add just one thing before I forget, which is kind of back to Alana's question of, of why is it good to study speeches and why is it good to deliver them, just like Smart was saying, which is it also can broaden your vocabulary. And one of my favorite facts to talk to our class about was that Churchill's average vocabulary was 60,000 words. Uh, the, the average human's vocabulary is about 20,000 words. So if you begin, it gives you know, more speeches and then you pick out finer words, you can maybe enhance your own uh, vocabulary or, or sense of English. But moving on to, to the more pressing question of how to improve, which is there's an old poll that's been around forever. I think the Sunday Times had something about it a few years ago, which is that more people fear public speaking than death, which is a, which is a frightening thing uh, because I, would, I think I would fear dying and no longer existing more than having to get up and speak to a few people. Um, but I think it comes down to uh, people say, oh, I get so nervous, you know, and I say, that's good. You know, nerves, nerves mean you care about performing, right? It's a good thing. And I quit theater uh, when I stopped having nerves because I, mean, I didn't care anymore. But I think it's important to turn those nerves into excitement, right? It's an opportunity to privilege to be able to speak in front of people. And I think at the same time, people have a, sometimes, especially when they're younger, have a lack of confidence, which is that they feel like nobody wants to listen to what they have to say. When in reality, you know, People are, are, are bored or people are just sitting there. They want to be entertained. They want you to tell them a story. They want to hear what you have to say. Uh, and so you, know, you shouldn't have to race through your speech or, or talk quickly because you want to get it over with. People are here to listen to you speak, uh, own that moment, enjoy it, and connect with them, right? And so I think if you focus on uh, not just the 3,000 people you have to speak to, but maybe the one or two people in the audience you can find and really connect to them one-on-one, -on -one, you may find an easier ability to, to improve your skills and to give a good speech. Um, but I would also add that there are a few things, maybe tips or tricks. I don't know. Smart talk about broad. I can more do the specific elements, which is, you know, the power of the pause, the power of slowing down. I talk fast still. I talk even faster when I was a kid. And it was always a, a somewhat of an impediment for my public speaking. But it's important to relax, to take important pauses when you need to, to stress a point. I think the importance of your presence, how you look, how you dress is, is very critical. Uh, smart and I always talk about this, but whenever we speak or whatnot, I usually wear a red tie. It's just the, it's a tie I prefer. Smart uh, has his own outfit, but it's what, what makes you comfortable, right? Becoming uh, comfortable and when you're when you're speaking is key. Gestures, um, once again, you know, Smart and I are big on gestures. Uh, it's, there's a fine line between looking like a flailing chicken and looking like a, a dead man, but if you can find that line, it's very critical to to emphasize a certain point or what gestures you use. The master of that is is former President Bill Clinton, who when he wanted to you know express his frustration would throw his hands up in the air when he wanted to make a point. Uh, he would point with his with his uh, index finger. And, and some other things are, you know, quoting great men and women. Uh, all speeches that we talked about were a reference or an allusion or a quote to a former speech, right? As Samar said, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address was a reflection of Pericles' funeral oration. Uh, Reagan's Challenger Address in 86 uh, quoted from a very famous poem uh, about, about aviation. And, and so, you know, quoting great men and women is important. Uh, of course, there's a fine line as well. You know, Abigail Adams told John Adams, you don't have to quote great men to be one, but it is important to know that you're paying homage to the past, to the, the previous great orders. And then I think the single biggest thing, for me at least, it was is a technique that Reagan, President Reagan had adopted, which is that uh, you should first memorize and then conversationalize. And sometimes when you read a speech, you know, verbatim, it sounds very, you can tell when someone's doing it. You've, we've all seen it. Someone gives a speech, they're reading directly from notes. It's a, it's a snooze fest, right? And then at the same time, you can have another person to give a kind of a very similar speech, but not really look at the notes directly. And it can be so entertaining. How do they do it? And a technique that I do is I look at a sentence, I look at a or, you know, or a paragraph or whatever. I quickly skim through it. And then now that I know it in my head, I put my own words into it. I conversationalize. So instead of memorizing and reciting, I'm speaking. I'm just, I'm just chatting to, a, yes, a large group of people, but no different than if I was chatting to one or two groups of people. So don't you know find yourself confined to the box of, of a pre-scripted speech. Uh, conversations change, situations change, your audience changes. Make it how you feel. Make a judgment call. How would I speak to this audience? How would I speak to this group of people? How would I make this my own? And so whenever I let's say practice on my own and recite a Churchill speech, I'll see how he did it, and then I'll kind of say, okay, what's the broad theme of this paragraph? And then I'll say how I'd say it, and see if it's better or worse, and how I can adjust. Yeah, the, the conversational piece is so important. When you when you write essays for school, you're kind of taught to, you know, you want to be a little fancy, you want to philosophize, you want to use all these complicated words, utilize instead of use. But when you when you're giving a public speech, 
you want to be as simple as possible. You really just want to talk to the audience as if you're just talking, you know, over uh, over a cup of coffee. You're just having a conversation with them. That's that's the real way to to connect with your audience. Just talk to them as if they're normal people, and and this isn't some big affair. It's it's just a chat. I, I think the other great resource that that we have today, and we're so lucky to have it, is YouTube. I mean, you can. There are so many videos online of you. You know, you can watch Kennedy, you can watch Reagan, Clinton, Obama give hundreds of hours of speeches, and you can you know see them in action, which you you really couldn't do 200 years ago. You could attend local speeches, but it would be very rare for you to see the best orators of the age um, and be able to watch so much footage of them. Today you can. So you know, instead of spending hours watching you know people play Fortnite on YouTube or or watching cat videos or whatever <laughs> kids watch these days. Watch, you know, watch some great speeches and learn from them and then and copy them in your daily life. You know, now I'm wanting to go watch like Nick's speech from when he was 12, you know? So, um, yeah, does that count as one of the great speeches of history? <laughs> it's it's definitely a speech from history, whether it's great or not. <laughs> that, will, that will be the, no, it, 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 it is a really good speech. It, 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 it is a really good speech. I've watched it um, and it's 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 very funny. It's very funny. You should definitely watch it if you have time. <laughs> Uh, and so these tips were a lot better than like just the standard like picture everyone in your underwear. I've tried that; it didn't really work. That's a re- it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> I don't know what that and even means. <laughs> I guess my own tip of mine is before I go out and do a speech or have an interview, I put on my favorite song and I just dance in my room to boost my energy and like be happy a little bit and get excited about speaking. Um, that's my own two cents. That's what I like to do. Also, I practice in front of my dogs because I have a lot of dogs. Um, but thank you. Yeah. I mean, whatever <laughs> works, right? I mean, for me, like my, my personal technique is I will, and Smartha knows this from time to time, is I will do what actually President Reagan did very similar is I'll eat something sugary and I'll drink some hot water. Gets my voice clear. Uh, so I can speak in more of a baritone level. And I'm also kind of like hyped up on sugar so I can be a little more energetic. That's just me, but everyone has their own you know, technique. Uh, well, thank you so guys for coming on and having not so much, may- maybe our own little speech um, with the four of us on this podcast. So be sure to check out wavelf.org, Wave Learning Festival, to find more great classes like um, Samartha and Nick taught great speeches and their other course. So thank you so much for coming on and joining us on this podcast. And we'll see you next week.